Welcome everybody. My name is Enrico Roveda, Global Marketing Director, and together with the owners, uh, the management, uh, and the entire America people, I'm very pleased to have you attending this webinar that is titled Nitides, the first SFA Sirolli Mustelut Instant has arrived. During this webinar, together with Dr. Kalberg from San Rafael Hospital in Milan, Italy, and Dr. Langhoff from San Gertrauden Hospital in Berlin, Germany, the Nitides unique features and clinical results will be deeply discussed. So without any further delay, I leave the stage to Dr. Kalberg for the beginning of the webinar. Thank you. So good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much to Enrico for the kind presentation. I'm very happy to be here. And my task today will be to try to explain you what is the drug eluting technology role in the SFA treatments. So to answer to this important question, we have to treat different topics. The first is what was the scenario before drug eluting technologies were offered in the market? And what was the added value of these technologies as compared to the bare balloons and the bare metal stands? Also, there was a problem with paclitaxel that probably all of you know, that was called the paclitaxel mortality gate, and we will briefly touch this problem. And finally, uh, we will see what is the currently available drug eluting stent technology on the market and what are their main limitations. So historically, uh, we always decided to treat the SFA using different weapons uh, as was related to the complexity of the lesion. And for example, using the task two classification, we were used to use simple PTA balloons for class A lesions and some class B lesions. And usually we're more prone to stent task B and task C lesions, where usually task D lesions remains uh, uh, surg open surgical treatment. When the uh, um, drug eluting technologies were available, uh, we tend to use drug coated balloons uh, uh, instead of simple PTAs and also uh, drug coated drug eluting stands. And why this? Because in most cases, uh, the simple PTAs was not uh, enough to ensure a good long term results. And that's it's very clear if you see uh, the more, uh, the, a lot of studies in was. Uh, uh, more the long are the lesions, less is the primary patency at follow-up. Also, we know that a lot of cases, especially in complex and in calcified lesions, require, after a simple PTA, a bailout stenting in case of recoil or dissection. So the indication usually in, for SFA stenting after PTA was a lesion with a high calcium content, very complex lesions, flow-limiting dissections, or high vessel elastic recoiling. But what did happen when drug eluting technologies were, were offered in the market? So if you start to see what was the result of drug eluting balloons as compared to bare balloons, to standard angioplasty balloons, you can see that all companies performed some comparative trials. And so Bard, Medtronic, Philips, and also Boston Scientific demonstrated very clearly a significant improvement in both patency at one year and freedom from target lesion revascularization at one year that was really significant with the drug coated balloons as compared to the standard ones. But also in this case, the normal balloons were not enough in a lot of cases. There was the same problem as for standard balloons. So if you see the trials with drug coated balloons, if, if you can see the left image in the slides, 
from left to right, the trials have longer and longer lesions. And when the lesions get longer, also there's more needs of bailout stenting. The bailout stenting rates is showed like a gray bar, you can see on the right. And you can see that for the long lesion and CTO trials with uh, tw more than 20 centimeters long lesions treated, the bailout stenting rate was more than 40% of cases. So the first thing is that drug-coated balloons did not solve the problem of bailout standing for complex and long lesion. The second thing was that in highly calcified lesions, and especially with grade three and grade four classified lesions, so severely calcified vessels, the long-term patency fall down to 50% at one year. And this is probably because uh, the drug does not arrive to the vessel wall in the right way in highly calcified lesions. So that drug-coated balloons were not enough, and we had to find also the drug eluting stands for the superficial femoral artery. You know that the first technology available as a drug looting stand was provided by Cook with a Cook Silver PTX stand that showed in, in significantly increased results at primary patency, even at five years, as compared to the bare stand platform that was the Silver Flex stand. So you can see a reduction in. Uh, uh, primary patency of 27% in case of the bare stent as compared to the drug eluting one, and also a reduction of uh, target lesion revascularization in case of uh, drug eluting stents. The same thing was observed by other companies, that was the Boston Scientific with his Eluvia stent, that as compared to the bare stent platform, the Innova stent in the Majestic trial had a very increased primary patency rate in 96% as compared to 66% for the Innova at one year. And also freedom from TLR was significantly increased with the Alluvia stent. So we can now conclude the drug added value in drug eluting technologies increase the indication for stenting with a drug eluting stent, not only in case of flow limiting dissection or very high elastic recoiling like bailout stenting, not only in the lesion, highly calcified lesion, but also when we have lesions at a high risk stenosis risk. And which are these lesions? are probably the long lesions, more than 15 centimeters, the chronic total occlusions, the highly calcified lesions, and also risk stenosis after failed previous procedures. And finally, we are asking and investigating about diabetic patients. So just a, a brief note about the Paclitax the mortality gates. In December 2018 was published a famous meta-analysis considering 28 most important uh, trials uh, mixing drug-coated balloons and drug eluting stands uh, and showing that uh, even if at one year the old cause mortality of patients were very similar in patients that received a paclitaxel device treatment uh, and patients who did not, Anyway, at two and five years of follow-up, it seemed that the mortality, the old cause mortality, was significantly increased in patients who received the paclitaxel. This was a little bit scaring and pushed the FDA and also the European Radiological Society to uh, change his recommendations and uh, uh, have a statement stating that there are some doubts about the safety of paclitaxel in the long term and that uh, physicians had to consider the real added value of paclitaxel when deciding to treat a patient with a drug eluting stand with paclitaxel. Anyway, after this initial meta-analysis, there were a lot of studies trying to confirm or, or uh, completely 
change the results of this analysis. And if we have a balance today, probably with a lot of high numbers, we are not so sure that paclitaxel may be associated with long-term all-cause mortality. Finally, we will have a little bit of focus on the two main drug eluting stents that were available in the market before the Nitidus stent was uh, received the, the CMR. The first is the Silver PTX, that is a polymer free stent, drug eluting stent. This means that the drug is loaded on all the surface, on the metal surface of the stent, without any polymer, without any additional uh, substance. And this means that it has a very quickly, very quick release, and also that uh, a lot of the drug is lost during the implantation of the stent, the shelf life, and the initial part of the stent life. This means that in the first 72 hours, probably more than 95% of the old drug is lost. So it's a very, very fast release. On the opposite side, we have the Alluvia stent by Boston Scientific that is a polymer uh, a polymer mediated release of paclitaxel. And this means that the release is very durable, but is uh, so, so you, you, we can say is a little bit too much long deliver because it's uh, something up to one year and the drug is slowly released for all this period. This means that uh, it covers uh, all the restenosis cascade of the first uh, 30, 60 days, and this is very important. But uh, we have uh, some possible uh, counterparts uh, in the long term. So in the Munster Registry, that is an independent uh, physician-initiated studies conducted in Germany with the Alluvia stent, 8% uh, uh, of patients developed uh, on the, in the, on the follow-up uh, something that is called halo, that is a uh, degeneration of the vessels like uh, that becomes ectasic with a hypoecogenic uh, halo around the stent. And this is currently under investigation. Same results were reported also at the two-year analysis of the imperial trial. And this was real for the Illuvia cohort and not to, with the silver PTX cohort. So finally, I come to the conclusion. The current approach to the SFA lesion is based on complexity, but PTA and DCB alone cannot be considered enough for a lot of lesion. And this why, that's why we, are, we have the bailout stenting, high rate, and also a, a better primary patency at one and two years with stenting. So also adding a drug to a device increases always its performance for both balloons, but also for stents. We have some doubts about the safety of paclitaxel due to the meta-analysis of 2018 and also to the present of HALO of recent studies. But today on the market, there are only two drug eluting stents with paclitaxel both. One is polymer free and one the other is a very long polymer uh, release action, and also there are some interesting limitations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kalberg, for the presentations uh, and set up the stage uh, for the next presentation. Uh, so uh, the NITIDES uh, technical characteristics and specifications. The NITIDES technology is uh, uh, driven by three main pillars. The Ablumina Reservoir technology to allow to have a control and direct elution of the drug to the vessel wall. The Amphilimus formulations, so a formulation made by Sirolimus and fatty acid. And last but not least, the bioinducer surface, a second generation of pure carbon coating able to have a very high bioendemo compatibility. So going in detail, uh, the Ablumina Reservoir technology is the capability to have some grooves on the abluminal surface only, as we can see from the section of the stent. We have the uh, reservoir where we are loading uh, the drug. 
and the drug is loaded without the use of any kind of polymer. Obviously, the reservoirs are located on the entire surface of the stent in a very homogeneous distribution. Dr. Kalber spoke about uh, the opportunity to have a polymer-free drug eluting stent. The Ablumina Reservoir technology is combining two important aspects. The first one is to have a polymer-free approach, but at the same time, it's able to guarantee a very sustained elution of this drug, because in any case, the role of the drug is fundamental to control the restenosis cascade. So we need to have a prolonged elution of the drug combined with a polymer-free approach. The Ablumina Reservoir technology is matching perfectly the two requirements because thanks to the, um, the design, fixed design of the reservoir, we are able to cite to identify a sustained release of the drug up to three months. What it mean? It means that a crucial role is the design of the reservoir itself because based on the dimension and on the shape, we are able to settle specific kinetic release. And for example, with a different kind of reservoir, we can have a fast release or a slow release. Our engineer define a specific fixed design in order to guarantee the sustained release of the drug over the time. Last aspect, of the Ablumia Reservoir technology extremely important uh, is the fact that thanks to this technology, the drug is uh, protected inside the stent. And this is extremely important because there are no contact of the drug with uh, the jacket. This is happened not only during the crimping, but also during the shelf life, and even more important, during the deployment of the stent where a friction between the external jacket and the stent could compromise the drug stability. Thanks to the Blumina Reservoir technology that the drug is completely protected into the stent, avoiding any kind of contact. But Nitides is extremely innovative also for another aspect. This is the first stent, uh, not only using uh, for the first time the sirolimus, but is the first stent using a formulation. So it means a combination of sirolimus with fatty acid. Uh, today on the market, uh, we have uh, different uh, antiproliferative uh, agents. We have uh, cytotoxic drug uh, induces uh, the cellular uh, apoptosis uh, like the pachytaxel or cytostatic drug, preventing the proliferation of the cell like the sirolimus and all the analog. The reason why Alvimedica decide to use a sirolimus, so a cytostatic drug, it's very clear, it's very simple to explain, because if we analyze the two different drugs from several point of view, effectiveness, toxicity, and tissue behavior, uh, from data available on the drug bank account and several articles, so we can see that, for example, for effectiveness part, uh, we need to evaluate several aspects. We need to evaluate the antiproliferative action and we need to evaluate the anti inflammatory action. Sirolimus is the only one providing both aspects antiproliferative and anti inflammatory. Pachytaxel is very well known for antiproliferative action, but in terms of anti-inflammatory, it's not uh, the right drug. Instead, the sirolimus is matching perfectly. But as mentioned by uh, Professor Kalber before, the issue and the uh, toxicity aspect of the pachytaxel are now under investigations. And it's clear that if we compare a cytotoxic drug versus a cytostatic drug in terms of toxicity, it's uh, very simple to identify the sirolimus as a drug with a very low toxicity. And we can check this aspect uh, analyzing the therapeutic uh, window. 
that it's very wide for the Sirolimus, instead for Pachytaxel is limited. And if we check the dosage of the therapeutic window of the Sirolimus, we are moving from 0.05 microgram per kilo up to 50, in comparison of only 30 and 40 microgram per kilo. So it's very different, uh, the therapeutic window between the two drugs. But the third element uh, we have to take consideration is also the tissue behavior of the different drugs. And if we compare lipophysicity, tissue uniform drug distributions, and tissue drug retention, we can notice a different behaviors of the two drugs. Sirolimus is presenting a higher tissue penetration thanks to the lipophysicity, but it's important to underline also the distribution of the drug in the media, so a higher distribution for the Sirolimus, lower for the Pachytaxel, but the different behavior on the adventitious, so the Pachytaxel is growing dramatically in the dentition, instead the Sirolimus is extremely stable. Another aspect is the residence of the drug into the tissue and higher is the Sirolimus. The reason why we decide to have Sirolimus is clear from a drug perspective because if we analyze the three main aspects, effectiveness, toxicity, and tissue behavior, we can see a clear winner if we compare Sirolimus and Pachytaxel. And Sirolimus is matching perfectly all the several features and the several characteristics of the ideal drug should have it. But in the nitides, we have a further step, a further improvement, because for the first time, we are using a drug, Sirolimus, in combination with a fatty acid. The two element, elements are working together in the same time in order to have a combined effect. And the role of the fatty acid uh, is fundamental because it's able to sustain the dilution of the drug over the time. It's able to modulate the bioavailability and also it's able to have an homogeneous drug distribution into the tissue. And this is crucial if we would like to maximize uh, the efficacy of a drug. Also in terms of uh, uh, drug concentration into the tissue. If we have a pure drug, uh, like the sketch on the left, uh, we have a high concentration of the pure drug at a peak level, but inside the tissue, the drug concentration is decreasing. Thanks to the use of the fatty acid instead, we are able to have an homogeneous distribution because the role of the fatty acid is to help the penetration of the drug thanks uh, uh, into the cell membrane. So there is uh, a permanent enhancer factors helping the absorption of the drug from the cell membrane. So we are able to provide a higher um, concentration of the drug. And this is crucial for this kind of technology. And the last pillar to mention is the bioinducer surface. So it means that the stent is integrally and permanently coated with a very ultra thin film. We're speaking about 0.3 microns of pure carbon. The role of the bioinducer surface is extremely important because it helps the endothelizations of, uh, of the stent, reducing the thrombogenity and the inflammation trigger. Speaking about uh, uh, self-expanding stent, so uh, nitinol devices, we are able to block the ions release. So the bioinducer surface, it's able to create a barrier versus this kind of release reducing any kind of inflammatory process and after is crucial the role to reduce the foreign body reaction introducing a stent into an artery. The product uh, is available in three different size in terms of diameters six, seven, eight and the lengths are from 20 up to 150 millimeter. The stent is available with two different catheter lengths, 85 and 125 centimeters. So in order to match to cover different kind of approach. 
resuming the technological advantage of the Nikiverse, uh, we can really emphasize uh, the three main aspects uh, of uh, the Nikiverse. First of all, the Abluminar Reservoir technology, because we are able to offer into a polymer-free platform a sustained release of the drug up to three months, avoiding any kind of drawback related to polymers. In terms of drug, uh, Nikides is extremely innovative because it's not uh, the first uh, sirolimus eluting uh, self-expandable drug eluting stent, but it's the first one using a formulation of sirolimus plus fatty acid. And the role of the fatty acid is to emphasize the action of the drug, increasing bioavailability, permeability, and last but not least, the entire device is, is coated with a bioinducer surface. So a pure carbon coating able to increase the bio and the more compatibility aspect. I would like to leave the stage to, to, uh, to the Dr. Ralph Langhoff because it's important to move from the rational, the technical aspect into the clinical side. And uh, uh, Dr. Ralph uh, Langhoff, we present the two years data of the Illumina trial, our first human study related to the Nikides. Dr. Langhoff. Okay, Diego, th thank you for um, the, uh, yeah, setting the stage and uh, for the invite. Yeah, so uh, there were a lot of remarks just at the very beginning. Uh, so, um, interesting uh, data um, and also um, interesting background information about how this stent um, is going to work. Um, I will now present the uh, yeah, 24 months uh, results, um, which uh, are available and also subgroup analysis of the diabetic um, subset. So the Illumina study design was, I would say, a straightforward design. So we uh, implanted these stents in uh, 10 centers in Europe. So it was primarily a German, um, Italian, French cooperation. Um, only adult patients um, in the superficial femoral artery and proximal popliteal artery as per IFU. And we included de novo or restenotic lesions, which didn't receive a stent prior in the target lesion. Uh, it was a prospective single arm trial. Uh, primary endpoint was the composite event free survival at 12 months. Efficacy endpoint was primary patency at 12 months. And we had also secondary endpoints like technical success, composite event free survival, and primary patency rate at 6 and 24 months, and clinical driven TLR at 6, 12, and 24 months. Uh, so these were the cooperating centers, as said, so uh, German, Italian, and French centers. And uh, yeah, so Dr. Kalbeck and uh, myself, so we implanted also a lot of these um, stents and just had a good background uh, in the performance of this stent. Coming to the patient characteristics, so as that was just a you know, atherosclerotic subset of patients, uh, most of these men, age, mean age was 67 years, were male, smokers, diabetics, 35%, suffering from hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. So uh, I would say a very relevant clinical subset of patients we see um, in our everyday um, treatment. Most of the patients just received or had lesions in their uh, mid or distal SFA, some rare ones, 8% in the proximal SFA, and we also implanted a few stents in the popliteal artery here. Interestingly, these patients had calcifications, and 55% uh, of those patients um, had calcified lesions, 20% uh, even judged to be heavy calcified, and 35% moderate um, or little calcified. Average length uh, was around about um, 8 centimeters, reference vessel diameter was above five millimeters of 5.11. So not so small arteries. Interestingly, if you just compare this also to other trials, it fits into the range of most of the DCB trials also. Now coming to the safety uh, points, 24 month study results. 
we see um, that we just had 11 major adverse events, but only six of them were device-related, clinical-driven TLR, uh, as the device-related um, major adverse event, and we just had only that was, we also count device related, the worsening of the Rutherford score by two classes um, over the time from five to six. So, a patient with um, um, a CLI. Um, showing this into a graphic graph, so we just have a freedom for major adverse event of 91.9%, so almost 92%, which is pretty good and pretty safe. Um, Interestingly, also, if you just um, compare this, uh, so we didn't show this, but just to, to tell you, um, the other trial was a Limus stand was the Shiroko trial, and that was just the mortality rate after um, one year was quite high, interestingly, and also the, just the safety data was just not really in favor of the stand, so that's why this stand was taken from the market and was never released by Cordis, and they just only released the non-drug coated uh, smart stand here because of really safety issues with this polymer coated uh, liner stand. Um, efficacy endpoint 24 month study results. You see primary patency at two years um, higher than 80%. So that's a very good result here for a stand um, of 83.4%. TLR rate, very, very low. That was very low at 12 months. So we published this already, but it remained very low after two years, <clears throat> um, just 93.1% freedom from TLR. We had some interest in the diabetic subgroup. So 35% um, percent of those patients uh, were diabetic patients. And um, that was just also because these same or almost the same technology was also used in coronaries, and there were also very good endpoints in the diabetic coronary subgroups. We also looked here into the subgroup of, of diabetics here, and um, uh, Diego Sparrow just mentioned the um, formulation of fatty acid, and maybe that this is just also something which is, uh, helps these diabetic patients here. Uh, we see a freedom from TLR of 96.8%, um, so they outperformed even the others. Um, Dr. Kalberg was just mentioning the other trials like Silver PTX and Illuvia. And uh, so these were, you know, I would say, quite promising trials, keeping in mind that we just had these bad results with Shiroko. And I was personally astonished that uh, um, companies came up with drug eluting stents after these drawbacks uh, from, from Cordis. And Silver was just the first, as mentioned, then um, the Luvia trial just from uh, Cook and from Boston came up. And then just the newest technology here was Nitides um, <clears throat> some years ago. And as I said, um, even this was just, they were able to outperform the silver PTX and Luvia data. Major adverse events at two years, 8.1% for Nitides, 20% and 14% for Luvia. Um, relative risk reduction of 60% relatively 43% relatively compared to Illuvia. So it is, in terms of these three um, drug eluting stents, the safest stents within these um, landmark trials. Referring to TLR, um, Nididas also um, kicked out the others um, with silver PTX minus 66% in favor of the Nididas respectively, Illuvia, once again, minus 64%. So also a very, very uh, outperforming stand compared to also the other ones, which were even just, especially Illuvia, showing good results, but the Nitides was just topping it. Um, once again, diabetic uh, patients, so silver, I think especially because there was no carrier on it, uh, did not as well as the other ones. And you see here, Nitides was just able to have a relative risk reduction of 86%, respectively 73% compared to Illuvia. So once again, the combination of um, a Limus drug plus fatty acid plus this uh, formulation and the uh, way of this is just brought to the patient 
um, was obviously a very, very good idea. Um, so I maybe I want to show a case which I did uh, within the trial. Um, we just had numerous cases and we just looked for something which we thought in terms of length is a little bit more challenging. So that was just an occlusion and long lesion was a stenotic lesion here. So the occlusion itself was just not so long, but the lesion itself was judged um, to be uh, around about uh, 13 centimeters. That was just after passing this uh, probably intraluminally um, with uh, a wire. We um, went for ballooning here. We used a 520 millimeter balloon. Um, and you see here a large dissection. So a lesion where I, and maybe we can discuss this later on, uh, definitely would not go for a drug coated balloon here because it is, looks a little bit like spiral dissection here. And uh, it's definitely something which I would not leave uh, um, without a scaffold. So as we just put this patient into a trial, we just used the combination of a drug and a stand and used the needy death stand. We implanted a six by 150 um, millimeter needy death stand here. And that was just the re result after um, implanting the needy death stand and postulatation was a standard balloon here, good outflow situation. And we just didn't see any restenosis after 24 months treating a 50 centimeter long lesion by applying a needy death stand. We just have duplex ultrasound here, and that was just per protocol. I can show you much more images of this stand because we just had to measure every two centimeters just to really observe how these stands behave just two centimeters before directly at the edge and then every two centimeters within the stand at the outflow edge and just another two centimeters. And you can see here, just after two years, we still have a good, good flow here a biphasic flow, so no restenosis um, occurred in this patient, and patient is still doing quite well. Just to conclude, I would say that Nitidus represents the first and only zeroalimus eluting self-expanding peripheral stent today available. Although the Illumina study included complex patients and complex lesions, so patients with Rutherford 5 and lesions up to 14 centimeters, and 55% of those were judged to be moderately, respectively, heavily calcified. The study results at 24 months are remarkable and they are outperforming compared to the other existing drug-eluting stent uh, trials. In terms of safety, 91.9, .9, so almost 92% freedom from device-related major adverse events confirms long-term excellent performance and safety of the NITIDES device. In terms of efficacy, um, even better, 93.1% freedom from TLR and 83.4% primary patency rate demonstrates the yeah, efficacy of this uh, product. And once again, for the diabetic subgroup, uh, a freedom from TLR and almost 97% of the patient, which is, yeah, I would say, the best results we have seen in a um, uh, atherosclerotic diabetic cohort um, in the SFA. So the Illumina study results stand uh, 90 days at the top of excellence today in the peripheral drug eluting scenario. So um, very good um, outperforming device, which I'm happy. So the CE mark now, uh, we are in Germany at least available to uh, buy the stand just recently. Yeah, thank you. So I may uh, open the stage for discussing um, your thoughts and uh, so maybe um, just some questions. I just see here in the chat um, a question um, about subintimal recriminalization. Um, yeah, so maybe Andrea, what is your thought about this? Okay, Ralph, the questions are, what about subintimal recanalization? And also, the key asks if we put a stent also in these cases. My answer is yes. I always try first to have a luminal recanalization. But if this is quite impossible, I can go for the subintimal way. 
try to have a re-enter with a re-enter device uh, just at the end of the occlusion and try not to involve the popliteal or to re-enter in a flexion uh, region. Uh, but in case I get the again the lumen at the, for example, the third, the distal part of the SFA, I usually stand the lesion. And of course, in this case, a drug eluding stand may help to improve primary patency, in my opinion. What do you think, Ralph? Yeah, so I would agree. So um, I think subindimal, so we have a lot of experience with subindimal approach, and we would mostly go for oh, a lot of these lesions uh, need to stand then. And we also have experience with um, subindimal uh drug eluting balloon placement, which also seems to work. So there is uh, scientific data about this. Um, so that's why I would say definitely it is also a good approach to put a drug eluting stent um, into the subintimal space. I would not stay away from this. And I would also expect um, quite um, yeah, promising results. And I, I guess, so at least, um, so I remember another patient we just had where I probably, um, if I look for the, Results after PTA, I went subindimal, and uh, also this patient did quite well. So I, I think it it will work. I don't know why this should not work. And, uh, also, the the other question from the same uh, um, listener is: uh, Do you have experience in popliteal lesions? How does the stand works after months? Is it flexible? Yeah. So. Um, Per IFU, it's only allowed or it's just made to treat the SFA and the P1 segment or proximal popliteal segment. Um, personally, as we were only implanting these uh, stents actually in the in the uh, within the trial, so we don't have experience with popliteal um, stent placement. So it is. Um, it's not. I would say it's not as flexible as maybe the Supera stent. So um, there is a different flexibility, but I have no experience so far um, here um, how this is going to perform. It's something maybe we also have to, to look at and gain experience with this. I have the same impression of you, Ralph. Uh, I, I, I didn't have real experience in the P2 and P3 segments. We limited the experience on the P1. Uh, what what I can tell is that as regarding drug eluting stands, uh, it has probably a, a, a very good flexibility as compared to the other drug eluting. So the silver and the eluvia are not designed for the popliteal artery, of course, and are not like probably like the super stand and so so on are very similar. In addition, the the um, nitidus has the five millimeter diameter that maybe is more adaptable to popliteal diameter as compared to the to the six millimeter one of alluvia. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. So there is another question. Uh, please, how do you explain the higher freedom from TLR with diabetic subset patients um, at two years? Mm -hmm. So do you have an idea, Andrea, or...? I think, of course, this was an observation and, of course, on few cases. So we cannot have, of course, a demonstration of the mechanism. And also we don't have the, uh, the enough hard data to, to say that in diabetics we have a, a better TLR. But we must consider that the the particular formulation of Amphilimus is uh, um, particularly effective in diabetic patients thanks to their um, ability to have, uh, um, to have an, improve, uh, an improved absorption of lipophilic, uh, um, of lipophilic molecules through the uh, cells and this transports to the cell membranes is known to be enhanced in diabetic patients. So probably the drug arrives more in diabetic patients to the vessel wall than in non-diabetics, but this is just speculation. That's also what, what I have heard. Um, and maybe just someone from, from maybe Diego or Enrico can just comment on this. 
I remember that there was something also with coronaries, that there was an observation that diabetic patients just had a better outcome here compared to other stent technologies with this um, uh, Philemus formulation. So I think, as you just mentioned, Andrea, that it enhances the drug uptake into these uh, cells of diabetic patients. But that's what I just uh, heard. Uh, but I think it was worse to mention because uh, diabetics always did worse. And here they did better and also better in other trials than in other trials, which is, is I would say, remarkable. So we just have to keep an eye on this. Well, if I just can just add something uh, for what relates to coronary, I can just say that uh, there are a lot of experiences, mainly independent that have been done uh, in diabetics and uh, the results are extremely positive. Uh, there are some, uh, there is a, a study that has been uh, very recently submitted to TCT, for example, independent. We are talking about uh, 1,200 patients randomized only in diabetics. Wow. And uh, what has been seen so far is, let's say that usually the efficacy of the device, stands, uh, whatever, is reduced in diabetics uh, this seems not to be the reduction uh, so high uh, or minimal, let's say, with our device. So this, of course, can be an added value. At least this is what uh, is currently in evaluation in coronary. And of course, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see this uh, translated also into the peripheral field, of course. But this will be just seen with more accurate uh, evaluation, clinical evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Ralph, uh, uh, another question. Uh, how does the stand fare in very calcified vessels? Uh, is the radiant force adequate in this scenario? What do you yes. think? Yeah, so we just had, we had patients where uh, we implanted this into calcified arteries and the um, radial force, I would call, it, it, it's good. So it's not a, a weak stand, I would say. I think just from the radial force, it is good. Um, honestly speaking, when I first touched the stand, I thought, okay, so maybe this is a little bit even too strong or something like this. So it's just uh, from the not so, uh, we say in German, filigran, like, like other ones. But um, the, um, the re results, what we see right now, show us that it works also in calcified arteries and radial force, I can tell you, is is good definitely definitely enough i don't know if it's too much but i think it is good yeah so what first you... questions from 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 your side or from others uh just feel free to just ask within the, sh the chat we can we can read it and uh if so feel free please in the meantime, Ralph, I, I ask you one thing. What do you think about uh, uh, using a DCB in conjunction with uh, a drug looting stance? Are you doing it or what? No, right now. So uh, mostly we, if we just, um, as a redo case, I would say yes, definitely I would do it. So this would be restenotic. I would just use drug or the balloon. Um, we do not primarily enhance the dose by using a drug-coated balloon. Even here, we would just have a mixture, mostly because I personally, uh, I do not have that much experience right now with Zerolimus coated balloons. So we are part of some trials, but we are not using it at, at standard of care. So we still use packet coated devices. Uh, so then you may run into a situation where you have a Limus drug and a Pactitaxel coated balloon, which I would right now not do, and I do not have any experience, and I think there's no data of the combination of both. Um, I think if you, uh, I know this from, from other, from, from coronaries, that uh, I know that people use sometimes in coronaries, if they see severe restenosis or something which is re re restenotic, they apply two or three drug-coated balloons at the same lesion just to enhance the amount of drug to really yeah, yeah, react toxic on, on the arterial wall. And um, 
this is just only um, a kitchen recipe, but I know that it, it helped in some uh, patients just to really apply more drug on a very small part, which I think is an interesting idea. Um, I have no experience, but I would not stay away from it. This is just a polymer-free approach. Um, is this going to change your behavior in terms of duration of dual endly platelets or do you trust more this not polymer coated technology or what do you think about this not having a polymer on it um, yes probably um i feel a little bit more safe not to have the polymer as regards the needs of forced interruption or dual antiplatelet therapy, or maybe it's not so clear. If I have a patient who has the need to interrupt the uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, it would be better to have a polymer-free stance and probably is a little bit more safe in terms of thrombos thrombogenicity. And, you know, we're speaking about uh, big damage vessels, not like coronaries. So probably after one month in case of need, I, I can stop it in a relatively safe way. Yeah. And would you, uh, how long would you use um, dual antiplatelet in these cases? Usually normally in six, six months, I maintain it. Okay. So we always same time point or not? No, we will just we are even shorter, so we would just go for three months here with a stent and drug coated balloons. Right now, we just even decrease to one month. Um, but there is, I think, no strong ad advice just from from trials. You cannot really read that the longer is the safer. Um, so, but just a drug coated stent like with Nithides probably would go for uh, for three months yeah. and um, so I personally I would say uh, I think that the uh, the way um, the stent is built with this reservoir technology so it's only on the abluminal side the drug I think that was a smart move because um I know this from, from, from uh, angioscopic images from Japan that uh, silver stands where they have also not only, only on the abluminal side, but also on the luminal side, a drug is going to take a long, long time that um, they have a neo intima on the stand. So probably to me, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the higher chance and the better option just to really incorporate the stent to the vessel wall by having a neo intima on the luminal side. That's why I think the idea to make this reservoir technology on the abluminal side was a good idea. Yes, of course, also polymer coated driven stents are the same, have the, have the polymer and the drug in both sides, both abluminal and intraluminal sides. So you are, you are very right. It's a very slow neo-endothelialization in this case. Are there further questions from the audience or from, from you, Andrea? I think we have touched uh, very interesting points and um, really all the panorama regarding the needed stance uh, on the engineering basis, the results of the trial, the comparison with the currently available technologies, I think that was really clear. So in my, my view, all questions were answered. Okay. So then maybe uh, yeah, I want to close the session and just, I think, um, thank you just for uh, sharing also the data um, from Ivy Medica, from Diego Squara, and also from, from your insights into um, the drug diluting technology per se. Um, for me, I think it's, it's just a promising situation that we just do not have a new kit on the block, but something uh, which has really um, sustained and supported data. And most of the trials, when we come to a CE mark, we just have only 12 months data. Now we have 24 months data. 
and they are quite promising. So um, this is uh, very good supported by data and uh, we are yeah, looking forward to, to interesting trials to just better options to treat our patients with a very unique and very uh, new and modern te technology here, um, which is uh, yeah, supported by scientific background um, and by uh, quite a lot of technology in terms of formulation of the drug, in terms of building of a stent. And um, also, I think just Diego mentioned this, that this is also a carbon coated stent. We do not really know what this is if this beneficial so much compared to other things, but uh, we just had this discussion here in our hospital because we are just patients with allergies against uh, nickel. So nickel. nickel, so there are always discussions that this is just maybe benefit to do something with a passive coating here, like a carbon coated stand. So this is also something um, in terms of just thrombocytes who may just stick to these stents and less in those very um, slippery carbon coated stents here. Um, that this is just another technology which is quite interesting. We didn't discuss this that much, but um, it is, I think, other unique uh, situation for this stent here. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you just for uh, also the Audi Medica group and maybe just Diego, you want to just get the last words? I will just to thank uh, Dr. Ralph Langhoff, Dr. Andrea Kalberg, and all the participants uh, to this uh, important event for us uh, because we are launching uh, a new technology. Of course, we already planned uh, a symposium during the next CRC related to this topic. So it will be online uh, on the 28th of September. So thanks again for... Uh, your cooperation, uh, the attention of the audience, uh, and uh, hope to be in contact later on for further uh, questions or specification on the product. Thanks again uh, to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.